Nancy Sermon, welcome to the show. My pleasure. So you've written several books. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of them today. Uh, one of your books that I really enjoyed was Stoic Warriors. You look at Stoic philosophy and how it can inform the military or how the military prepares soldiers for war, but then also deal with the aftermath of war. Um, before we get into the details about Stoicism's connection to the military, I would love for you to give us a, just a brief summary of what Stoicism is, because I think you did such a great job of it in Stoic Warriors. Well, Stoicism is an ancient philosophy, uh, both that the ancient Greeks uh, after Aristotle and the Romans embraced. And it's in the tradition of ancient philosophy of being concerned about the good life and flourishing, but they take issue, and these are especially the Romans like Seneca and Marcus Aurelius uh, and Epictetus, they take issue with the idea that happiness should include exposure to luck, good and bad. And so they develop a philosophy of self-sufficiency and self-reliance, essentially, um, well before um, Emerson. <laughs> and the idea is that your virtue alone should be sufficient for happiness. It's actually a Socratic position from way back. Um, and so that's the idea, that cultivating your strengths and uh, intellectual and uh, endurance are a matter of enormous self-discipline and that you can be, in a certain way, invincible is too strong, but protected from the outside world infringing on your projects. Okay, so it's basically you're not letting the world or all the, the chaos, the things that are in flux, disrupt you emotionally, mentally. It's not even an issue. That's right. And the emotional part of not being disrupted is critical. They think that the emotions are disturbances, almost um, um, pathologies, if you like. So, uh, and the idea, some ways, is that emotions, and the, the normal, ordinary ones of fear and of, of even love and anger, um, are ways that you are attached to the world and want the objects of those emotions. And so they leave you open to disappointment and to the inability to... Um, uh, to, to avert or go for the objects of the emotions in the case of fear, adequately avert the risk and in the case of desire, um, sort of get what you're going for. Yeah. So, so it's very kind of attachment free in a way, not Buddhist. It's not about quiet meditation and getting rid of the self. The self is very important, but it's just should be your reason has, has dominion in this world. Yeah, and I guess they'd say a lot of the emotions are based on perception, right? So if you can change how you view an event, so it's not the thing itself, like if you're, your child dying, that's not the thing that's actually disturbing. It's just your perception of how you approach it is what causes the disturbance within you. That's right. So they have this view that emotions are a sense to impressions. That's the way they put it. And a sense to ways that you're being perceived upon, you might say, as you're saying. So there, and you can say yes or no to those assents. And you might be affected by it just sort of subliminally almost. You know, you, you, um, there's a great example they give you're on a, you're on a ship and uh, someone, you're supposed to be a sage, a great sage doctor, but yet you start turning green. And so someone turns to you and says, I notice. You, you profess to be a sage, but you're, you're getting very seasick and scared. And the response that a Stoic will allow, well, yes, but that's just a pre-emotion or a proto-emotion. It's kind of a physiological response, but, and it's momentary. And the true Stoic won't indulge it. So, you know, I can sort of say no to it without it taking hold and, and without, the, without it really fully coming to fruition. And that, in a sense, tracks where we are uh, in terms of our understanding of, of psychology. Um, Kahneman, for example, the great Nobel Prize winning psychologist, has a, 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 the notion, and many do, that we have two track systems of emotions, 
those that are sort of fast track and, and go without much brain circuitry and very immediately responsive and those that are more mediated. And so the Stoics had that notion early on and they think that maybe some are a kind of arousals that you can't control, but you won't be impugned for having them. And in the long term, you can maybe control even those better than you do right now. Yeah. And it also seemed they were very um, uh, sort of foretold cognitive behavioral therapy. <laughs> to some degree, to yeah. To some degree. That's right. right. Because they they view the emotions as not just uh, impressions, but the part of your brain that's doing it in a sense. Well, that, we'll put it differently. The part of – you are just reason. They're, uh, they're um, monolithic in that regard. And so you uh, should be able – to control emotions insofar as they are a sense, but a sense to that are governed by reason, and the and uh, and so uh, even your perceptual um, capacity should be under the control of reason. So a lot of talking and a lot of uh, suasion and um, persuasion should be able to change your your state, what you eventually a center or um, do not give assent to. Okay. And I think there's this popular conception of Stoics as just like not having any emotion whatsoever or not enjoying life. And you have to, to be a Stoic sage, you have to go off into a cave and cloister yourself off. But a lot of the, the famous Stoic thinkers, they were like Marcus Aurelius. He was an emperor and he lived a pretty good life. Seneca, he was the tutor to Nero and he lived a, a pretty, he enjoyed things. He enjoyed life, probably wore nice clothes, ate good food. Um, it's like, how does how does Stoicism allow for us to enjoy the good things in life? Is this where the whole things indifferent come into play? Well, popular Stoicism, first of all, is the kind of notion, suck it up and truck on. If you're in the military or, 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 or you profess a, a kind of Stoic, popular Stoic mentality, you are just sort of um, sucking it up and moving on. Um, the Stoics were um, somewhat um, mixed about this. The Roman Stoics were, in embracing Stoicism, embracing a very widespread popular view out there. You know, it was a, it was a court, as you say, it was it was the the court's philosophy. Um, Seneca was the tutor to Nero, and Marcus Aurelius was the emperor who wrote the Meditations, which were to himself um, at night after during the day, a huge golden statue of himself would be wheeled out and then wheeled back. So he doesn't look like too much of an ascetic um, when he's leading, uh, you know, massive uh, legions of troops and has gold statues um, on his behalf. That said, he is very much trying to distance himself from those things with which he doesn't have full control. So Epictetus, um, who was once a slave, but then goes on to teach philosophy, in the time of Nero will say, of those things that you cannot um, control, you know, say that they are indifferent to you. Now, the indifference doesn't mean, as you were sort of saying before, it doesn't mean you don't feel anything. It means, <clears throat> excuse me, it means that you're not attached or desirous fully of the objects of your interest and that you can have them or not have them in that regard they're indifferent not you're, you don't have an attitude of indifference but they're they're not constitutive of happiness that's what's critical they do not add one iota to your happiness if you have things that you um, that, that you desire um, through the emotions, nor do they detract if you get the things that you don't want. Having them is better than not having them, <laughs> <laughs> but they don't add to the thing that's called happiness, flourishing, thriving. Okay, so you can have lots of money for a moment, but if you lose the next day, you're like, meh, it's no big deal. Yeah, you kind of develop this notion that uh, if my kid dies... Um, and I lose the things to which I am really attached, then I have to realize that they really weren't a part of true, genuine happiness. Now, there's going to be cognitive dissonance for most of us because you don't get to be a sage 
ever for most of us. And you'll still hold on to worldly goods. And by that, I don't just mean material goods. I mean the goods that many of us hold on to, love of our children whom we prize and uh, spouses and partners whom we um, adore and whose loss would be to rip something precious out of our souls and psyches. Um, But they still think that if you got to the highest point of perfection, you would somehow realize and embrace the idea that your goodness, if you had developed virtue, was sufficient for your flourishing. Let's get to this, this connection to the military, because you are, you're a professor of ethics. Um, how did you get interested in seeing how Stoicism could inform uh, military life? Well, I was at the Naval Academy in the mid-90s in the wake of a cheating scandal, and I was asked to design a, a brigade-wide ethics course, which I, I had taught ethics for years, and so that wasn't a, a novel task, you might say. But on the other hand, I hadn't talked to military folks, and not just midshipmen, but officers. So I did the stuff I always do, Aristotle, Kant, um, Plato, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, some contemporary readings. When I got to Stoicism early in the course, everyone resonated with it. In part, they resonated with it because one of their own, uh, that is uh, Admiral Stockdale, Jim Stockdale, uh, had embraced Stoicism wholeheartedly. He was a graduate student way back uh, at Stanford and kind of wandered into the philosophy department and someone handed him a a text of Epictetus, the little handbook, and he has sort of said, what do I need that for? You know, a martini drinking aviator who plays golf, what do you need that for? So he put it aside. But then he found himself on the Ticonderoga in the middle of, um, uh, of on his way to Hanoi, or excuse me, on his way to Saigon, and he um, started reading it in the wardroom, and then one day, he's an aviator, he was shot down, and the lessons of Epictetus were sort of inscribed in his soul, and he said, I'm Jim Stockdale, leaving the world of technology and entering the world of Epictetus, and he imbibed it um, for himself, it was a salvation to be able to say no to the things that he wasn't in control of because he ended up being in uh, prison as a POW for about seven and a half years or so, two two and a half in solitary with leg irons. So he found this uh, absolutely empowering and it helped him as the um, head of the chain of command, which there is uh, in a a, uh, military uh, prison where you're POWs. So... Uh, being able to say, no, I control the show and not you, Cat Eye, who is the name of one of his um, his torturers slash, slash uh, prison guards, was critical to his survival. And and so the mil- l- long story is, the, uh, it made sure the military knew of his story, and even if they didn't, if they were to read Epictetus, they would find It's kind of good medicine for those who are in situations of deprivation and stress. Yeah, this is where the, uh, I guess, what's called the Stockdale paradox comes from. Uh, I think he said that the way he survived was like he, you had to be both hopeless, but also have hope at the same time, which is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. Um, So going on to this, in in Stoic Warriors, you you look at how Stoicism can inform different aspects of a soldier's life uh, throughout their career. And we start off with talking about the body. So for uh, a soldier, his body is important or uh, because that's they're, they're, it's trained to be fit, to be able to do hard work, to, to fight. But when you're a soldier, there's a good chance that you're probably, you might lose a limb or become disfigured. Um, and that affects them. I think sometimes I think that affects the soldier more than losing the limb. It's just the emotional trauma that comes from being disfigured from a, an IUD or something like that. But the Stoics would say, like you know, the, the hardcore Stoics would say, well, you know, it's your body. It's something external. You shouldn't be dis- disturbed by that. Um, 
Is there a stoic approach to our bodies that takes into consideration the role that our our body plays in our sense of self? Well, I'm not sure uh, they fully do. The most exaggerated case is Epictetus, who thinks of your body as just one more encumbrance, um, sort of like a little donkey that you that is you, and then you have to carry all these. Uh, the things that it needs and so you've got to carry the bucket of water and you've got to carry your food and all, all of the encumbrances and so it's a it's an unpleasant image and it's just uh, being burdened down um, and you're supposed to be able to distance yourself as you say from the physical injuries that you might suffer by realizing that the body is somehow not Re- not you, the, which, is, uh, which is reason. That's a hard view to have, uh, given in fact that uh, you couldn't survive without a brain, and the brain is one of the, uh, of the body parts that it may not visibly be disfigured, but certainly you mentioned IEDs. IEDs uh, can cause enormous rattling and traumatic brain injury, TBI, which leads to other kinds of... of um, difficulties in being in the world, having memory, having um, good cognitive functioning and, and the like. So is there a, a, a more palatable version of Stoicism? Um, Stoicism is kind of hard to swallow in its full form, so I would probably say not really. I've always advocated to the degree that I find myself attracted to Stoicism, a kind of moderate Stoicism where there are blessings and curses. And I guess Seneca is the person who's always um, feeling the tension. He says, I'm the doctor. They call themselves doctors who heal um, the pathology of, of, of emotional attachment. But I'm also the patient meaning I'm sick too. I can't fully get rid of my attachment to my body. I can't fully get rid of my grief that I lost a a dear friend and that I find myself sinking in in sorrow. I'm struggling too. And so he's always acknowledging the, the way in which the externals touch him and that he's trying to limit their impact a bit. And I guess that's one way to approach stoicism moderately and with um, some recognition that if you are trying to minimize uh, the the effect of these devastating accidents on you, that you you go forth with some humility about just how how much you can control in the end. Yeah, and that's one of the things I, I the problems I've had with stoicism is that you try to be stoic, like you make that your ideal. Like I'm just not going to let this bother me at all. Whether you be a, you lose a limb or something happens, you know, even like the 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 daily trifles of life that just annoy you. But the problem with it is you set that as your ideal. And if you don't achieve it, then you like get angry at yourself because you, yeah. you feel bad about yourself that you didn't achieve that ideal. And it sort of spirals downward. Well, that's right. I think um, perfectionism can be a curse. And, um, and to the degree that the Stoics set very, very perfectionist ideals, with it can come the psyche that Freud would say you, produces a harsh superego and anger and, and self-anger um, in the form of guilt or in the form of shame um, and certainly in the form of disappointment. And so I'm not sure it's a, a, a wonderfully winning strategy. The other thing is you have to um, be able to uh, acknowledge loss in order to go forward to readjust to new body images, um, to be able to do the hard work that will come with um, re, re, uh, um, physical therapy and, and kind of reconstitution of yourself. If you've lost, as some of those I write about in After War have, full, full half of their body. You know, they've lost the whole bottom of their bodies. And they can't go on as they did before. And so there has to be an adjustment to loss that does involve a grieving process if you're to go forward. And I'm not sure the Stoics are the best uh, uh, philosophers to help us with that. So let's talk a little about this, uh, the anger, because it seems throughout Western history, anger has played a big role in the ethos of the warrior, right? If we go back to Homer, 
mean, that's what that's what the Iliad was all about, right? Is how anger fueled this this ten year war. Um, and it, it seems like the military uses anger to an extent. Like through boot camp, you have the the stereotype of the the yelling drill sergeant from Full Metal Jacket and this the like like the things like that. But Stoics would say, well, no. Anger is one of those emotions you shouldn't have because it's a disturbance and yada yada. So, how did the Stoic philosophers approach war? If you know, other for for centuries, anger was often used as a motivator for for battle and for war. That's a great question. Um, anger whets the appetite um, for for uh, for for war and action. Um, it's often said. And so what do they replace it with? Well, just to sort of be clear, anger is this disturbance pathology. It, it, uh, Seneca rails on about it. It, it, it. it makes you livid and it causes enormous havoc inside you and, and in the world. And part of their railing against it is because Seneca and others are advising kings who use it a lot and who go to war needlessly or or throw their servants in in pools of sharks and the like when they break a crystal or do something minor so there's um anger management that's required and so that's part of their interest in being able to get rid of anger now anger comes in waves you know some people think you should be it is a good thing and other people think it isn't and anger also is uh, of, of a different sort um it's not clear that you need anger in order to motivate um or incite uh, uh, troops to battle what you might need is in the case of the drill sergeant, a performance of anger, just like the orator performs certain emotions, actors perform certain emotions, and they instill fear in their listeners, and that would get a young boot camp, a young person in boot camp, to sort of to move and and do better if you um, incite the wrath of your drill sergeant. Now, it, it could also be that the the inductee gets a real dose of anger that moves them to battle. But the problem, the Stoics will say, is that you can't shut it off um, easily. And so you have um, rampages and um, revenge um, killings and um, hadithas or nilis or the like. So um, the Stoics think that you can actually fight on principle. You know, you might have a sense of what's right and wrong and a sense of justice, and that will be able to carry um, carry you forth in in action. And I think it's a real live question as to how useful anger is. I mean, we wouldn't want to get rid of many would argue resentment, indignation, moral protest, moral outcry, if you don't have those emotional reactions to horrific world world scenes of refugees or or, or innocent victims being killed. Um, what? How, how do you morally engage? Um, but others would say, well, have that first proto-emotion of it, and maybe the Stoics will give you that. Have it so it kind of rouses you, but then be able to put it into or contain it and use your reason to motivate you forward after that. Use it as a transitional pivot and move on after that, and that may be a way to um, to get the, the, the best of both worlds. Yeah. Both, both light the match, but then contain it. Yeah, and speaking of that idea that you know the, the fear of anger is that once you get it going, it's hard to turn off, uh, particularly in warriors. I think you mentioned in your book how um, oftentimes when men return from war, like increases in spousal abuse mm, happen. Yeah, very, yeah. Yes, I mean it's a complicated story, uh, and to just say, well, it's um, there's anger management problems is, is too narrow. Um, there's all sorts of reactions to war that have to do with grief, have to do with the difficulty of civilian reintegration, resentment to civilians who don't understand, was uh, confusion about um, or, or anger about uh, the injustice of the war, whether it's the conduct or the cause or too many collateral killings that were authorized or not enough because then you lose your troops. 
the moral mess of war is endless, and you're asking thinking soldiers to sort it through. Um, and it's got to uh, bubble up in frustration as well as a certain kind of um, difficulty in adjusting to the tempo of life afterwards. So to just sort of say it's anger and that you can't control the anger when you come home, I think understates the moral complexity of trying to adjust the emotions of war to the emotions of civilian life. Yeah, I want to get more into the uh, the moral complexities of after war because that's what your most recent book is called After War. Um, but before you mentioned grieving, that's a problem that soldiers have, and the Stoic approach. Would, you know, you, there's a story of uh, I forgot who gave it, but like the king who forced a person to eat their own child, mm-hmm. and the the appropriate Stoic response was, "Well, that was thank you, you know, like not not be upset about, it, just do it and just calmly eat it and then go away." That to me seems uh, doesn't seem very healthy. A very healthy approach. I guess the question would be: Is there a way we can look at use moderate stoicism to help soldiers and civilians alike deal with the loss of loved ones? Well, that was Cambius, yeah, who who uh, uh, was uh, was asked to do that. I think um, there's it's so attractive to be stoic in some ways, and I'm one of those persons who's attracted to it. The world throws up tons of things that we can't control. The vicissitudes of fortune are around us all the time. The limits of our being able to uh, influence our children exactly the way we want to, or our spouses exactly the way we want to, or our students, or or the political process, or the army, or the navy, or or the course of, 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 of a country's future. We're just, we're small and we all live in systems and the systems collectively exert enormous amount of pressure on us and yet we are asked to hold on to our individual consciences and we can't always be whistleblowers and yet we have to do good in a world that's extremely flawed with pressures that we can't manage always. So why not try to be stoic about some of these things? Now, it doesn't mean indifferent, but it does mean know the limits of your control and try to try to expand the circle of your control as as widely as you can without being a control freak. Because no one likes a control freak who's managing other people's lives. Or if you're too self-managing, then you yourself or letting out to the experience of too many things that you can't manage that but but you need to feel so i think experimenting with the borders of control is the best way to be uh, a mindful stoic um and i you, you might say in the end of the day you end up an aristotelian <laughs> <laughs> that's really i think yeah you mentioned in the book how you know you know some soldiers right now that the way they deal with grief is maybe they'll they might not cry in front of their their troop but when they're in their tent with like their close buddy that's when they'll let it out have that moment of grief um so they're, they're like they're, i guess they're mindful of it well yes um there's always a performative element in being a leader and especially a leader with all the modeling that comes with wearing the uniform and projection to very young troops um, who may be less seasoned in, in battle than you are. Some more seasoned officers don't always face and often don't face the same stresses that, that um, the enlisted who deploy over and over again do. So you've you're, you're, you, you got to be there for them and you're sort of trying to show toughness. But if we look at the suicide rates recently, um, uh, we know that the modeling doesn't always hold in your most private moments. And it's, you, can't, you can't closet off parts of yourself and hope that you will forever not see them. They come back to haunt you. Yeah. So in your most recent book, After War, um, you make the case that in a lot of ways we've made clinical the emotional, mental, and moral wounds that our veterans come home with. Um, first off, let's talk about this, the, the moral moral wounds or moral trauma, because that's something you don't hear very often when we talk about uh, soldiers coming home from war. You hear about 
uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, lost limbs, but you never hear about moral trauma. How would you describe a, what is moral trauma? So moral trauma or moral injury is a sense of, uh, it's a psychological sense that you may have done wrong in a, in a serious way uh, or been wronged in a serious way or fallen from ideals that you subscribe to in a very serious way and that you um, um, are hurting. There's anguish as a result. So it can be accompanied by reactions of enormous um, guilt in the case of transgression or if you've been transgressed resentment or uh, in the case of falling short, uh, um, uh, annihilating shame. And... uh, the it's a psychological injury, but PTSD is typical, or, or PTS without the D for disorder, which some find stigmatizing, has clinically at least been understood as a fear response. You're responding to a sense of being helpless, to a threat, a life threat. And the treatment has been the kind of deconditioning of that fear and that life threat, uh, because you're now not in a c- condition of threat, but yet you're reliving the, the, the stimulus as if you were. Uh, we need to recognize that all sorts of emotions that, are, that, that, are, that cause anguish and enormous pain come home from war or come home from other kinds of assaults and, and, um, and in, infringements and that they're not all fear-based. And so moral injury is a way to, um, to, to talk about that. Like, like PTSD, it can be invisible, meaning you're not coming home from, uh, from the battlefield or, or, or from um, uh, a trailer in Nevada, if you're a, a remote um, pilot, with, with a visible loss, uh, miss, missing something or blinded or, or without uh, hearing. But you are coming home with, um, with a psychological injury. And so how, how do we, I, guess, I don't know if treat is the right word because it sounds, again, sounds clinical, right? I mean, we know what we can do for physical injuries, psychological injuries. You can go to counseling. But what do you do for moral injuries? Is it? Well, yeah, I think you still can um, see clinicians, mental health professionals. Um, so I don't mean to depathologize um, all of the suffering that comes home from war by no means. I and mean, we're very short on mental health clinicians um, in the services and in the VA, um, and people need to be able to reach out without stigma. But we also have to realize that some of what we do in this country um, isn't enough, and we could do more. Um, we say thank you for your service um, as a quick way of separating the war from the warrior. Um, but it's also kind of pat and a bit superficial and doesn't always lead to a deeper um, conversation that builds bridges between military and civilian. Um, we are afraid to ask what people's war experiences were or what people's experiences um, when they didn't deploy but are, are sitting um, uh, doing war-related work uh, on bases at home because we think we might be prying or it's private or we don't really know what we're talking about and, you know, and they're soldiers and they wear uniforms and we don't, so we live in different worlds. Um, we're not really so willing to engage in the hard conversation. Was it, a, was it an unjust war and we shouldn't have had it? And, and the awful feelings of futility that many soldiers feel as they think about what's going on with ISIS in areas they thought they secured and Tal Affair, Mosul, or Fallujah, etc. So um, there's a moral mess that comes home if you've got a thinking brain on you, and it some of it is um, some of it you can't process because there's a lot of cognitive dissonance. Some of it you don't want to process, and you want to just medicate with booze or uh, or medicate by driving fast on bases or medicate by being angry and and um, being prone to um, strike out and, and have altercations. Um, but some of it, it, it requires 
actual thinking about the circumstances of war and what you saw and what you did in a safe place with a person you trust. And so the opposite of moral injury is moral recovery and moral repair. And some of those emotions like guilt um, can be relieved a bit by empathy and self-empathy. Some of them shame by a sense of people hoping in you and you hoping in yourself. Trust, a, a, a sense of betrayal that your leadership betrayed you or your country betrayed you by re, um, restoring bonds of trust somehow. And that's civilian work as much as clinical work. Long yeah. answer, sorry. No, that's great. No, it's, I, I love that. Um, I'm curious if the military is doing anything proactively um, you know, I, I know they're working hard to get more clinicians uh, for mental health and things like that. But um, are they doing anything else to, I don't know, help soldiers prepare for after war and dealing with this, the, the moral complexities of it? Well, there are you uh, uh, both researchers and clinicians and um, lots of outreach groups that are beginning to recognize that moral injury has a slightly different face than clinically understood PTSD. So the, the Bible of, of clinicians for reporting for insurance purposes and for diagnosis, which is called the um, DSM, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, we're now up to, to um, edition five, has slightly changed the definition of PTSD so that it includes some factors that or experiences mood experiences i believe they call it they call it of guilt and shame and whatnot recognizing that it's not just um responses to fear so that's one thing um that in that bible out there of of diagnosis there's a wider understanding of 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 trauma and post-traumatic stress trauma um in addition um there are Folks that are doing active research on this on a on a on a clinical basis um, through the VA and in trying to set up treatment protocols uh, that would involve um, telling your story, but not in a sense of trying to decondition the fear, but trying to develop compassion for yourself with the buddy that you left behind, who whose life you just couldn't save, or the child's who was caught in a collateral incident, would she hold you and condemn you in the very way that you condemn yourself? That kind of thing. So the conversation is expanding um, in clinical circles, I think, as well as in outreach groups that deal with families that co- uh, who, are, uh, who are at the core of, of um, helping a returning service member uh, in retreats and the like. And, and, you know, and I go around talking at various conferences, there are many conferences. So, uh, it, it, it's it, it's uh, a slowly growing um, there's so awareness of the complexity of the issues. Very good. Well, Nancy, before we go, where can people learn more about your work? Uh, well, After War is a kind of character-driven, service member-driven uh, book. So uh, I would recommend that. Um, and um, it's available uh, at, at all places that sell books, including Amazon. Um, and it's extremely readable. And when I say character driven, it's, it tells the stories of service members who've come home. Many I've, uh, I've known for years who are my students or, or, or that I've known. So that's one place. I have a website, nancysherman.com that, um, has lots of information about the kind of work I do and the kinds of, um, interests I have. Um, so those are two places. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, Nancy Sherman, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Brett. Pleasure talking. Thanks. My guest today was Nancy Sherman. She is the author of the book Stoic Warriors and After War, and you can find those both on Amazon.com. Go check them out.